Okay, so despite what I said two videos ago, I'm not going to focus on what you can make physically with math. Um, decided that wasn't a great idea. And also, there's the whole world is on fire thing going on right now. So I decided that I'm just going to do math things that I've been spending my time on because, eh, why not? So today I wanted to show you a vector space that's really weird. It has this really, I think it's a really cool property that a lot of other vector spaces don't have um, because of an operation that it plays well with um, that most vector spaces don't play nice with. Um, so in order to get this started, I'm just going to start talking about vector spaces. So a vector space over a field F is a set of elements V called vectors together with two compositions, plus and scalar multiplication. Now that plus composition acts exactly as we would want addition to act and how we usually think of addition acting on things like the real numbers or the rationals. So the most common examples of vector spaces actually come from physics or rather are from math and are applied to physics or like jointly came into the fields at the same time. I'm not really exactly 100% sure on the history of the development of vector spaces, uh, but usually physicists really care about them. So uh, yes, I'm gonna talk about a few of them. So the first one that I'll talk about is the one that you probably saw a lot when you studied physics in high school, and that's just the real plane. And so a lot of physics you can do in the real plane, it really gives a nice, relatively not complex space to work in. You can take vectors like these two here, and there is a notion of adding those two vectors by plugging them head to toe, and you can get a resultant vector and do all that fun stuff. Great, awesome. Next, we have R3, which is just the 3D world in which we live, and that's more common when you're modeling things in three dimensions. Works a lot like the plane, but just one more dimension is available to you. And lastly, and this one is probably the one that if you know a little bit about vector spaces, you might think that I would be talking about in this video, but I'm actually not talking about it at all, is the L2 space over an interval. So for example, if you take A is equal to zero and B is equal to two pi, we can look at the L2 space from zero to two pi. And some functions that live in that space are like sine and cosine of x. And in that case, sine and cosine are actually our vectors. Those functions are vectors in this vector space. And so there are more vector spaces that physicists tend to think about, quantum mechanics and quantum stuff in general. There's generally a different type of space that we're worried about with different, like over a different field and with different vectors and whatnot. Um, but if we're just looking at these three for intuition, we can sort of tell what the building blocks that made up these vector spaces are. So in the case of R2 and R3, the building blocks can be thought of as direction and magnitude, whereas in the case of the L2 space over an interval, um, you can think of it as frequency and amplitude being the two main building blocks. But the vector space I want to talk about today is actually built from the basis of symmetry, which sounds really weird, and it is. Um, it's very counterintuitive. And when I first sort of started to read about this thing, I was kind of surprised because even though the proof that we'll get to later in this video is quite simple, it's not something that you naturally would think about, I would assume, at least I have never naturally thought about symmetry producing a vector space. So what is symmetry? So probably the most accessible example of symmetry that I can talk about is when you make a snowflake out of paper. Um, in this example, yes, the snowflake does have six point symmetry for those that of you that are concerned about the accuracy of the symmetry of this thing. Um, but aside from that, uh, when we think about the symmetry on shapes and also on the snowflakes, usually what we've been taught or what we learned about in school was that 
you have these axes of symmetry and you can fold over and reflect over these axes of symmetry such that you get the same snowflake after you're done reflecting. There's, It ends up in the same position as it was before if you were just looking at it. And so reflections are great, but mathematically symmetry has a lot more depth to it. In fact, symmetry can be thought of as an invariant set of transformations on a given mathematical object. So I'm gonna get rid of the snowflake and we're gonna to transition to talking about a square. And in this case, the square is a graph. So it has four vertices and four edges and the vertices are one, two, three, four and the edges are one is connected to two, two is connected to four, four is connected to three and three is connected to one. So if we go ahead and apply the rotation by 90 degree map to this graph of a square, we're gonna end up getting a graph back that just looks like the graph of the square that we had before, except the vertices we labeled are going to be in a different order. So instead of one being in the top corner, three will be in the top corner, followed by one on the top right corner, then two on the bottom right, and then four on the bottom left. And so even though the vertices changed places, the overall shape has remained the same, and so we can say that the rotation by 90 degrees is a symmetry of the square. So instead of rotating or reflecting the square, we're gonna go ahead and shuffle the vertices in a explicitly defined way. So we're gonna say that the first vertex will go to where the second vertex is, and the second vertex will go to the where the the second vertex will go to where the first vertex was. The third vertex and the fourth vertex will just stay in the same spot. So after that map, instead of getting the square that we had before, we're gonna get this hourglass graph thing with a crossing between edges. Because remember, a part of this graph structure is that we're forcing certain vertices to be connected to one another. And when we apply these transformations, we're going to want to preserve those edges as we do them. And so since after we do this shuffling of vertices, we don't get something that looks exactly like the previous graph, this map is not asymmetry of the square. And so I guess the next natural question there is that, well, with the rotation, we just moved around vertices and we got a symmetry of the square. But when we moved around vertices this other way with this switching of one and two, we didn't get a symmetry. But maybe if we change the object, we will get a symmetry. And in fact, yes, we will get a symmetry if we choose the right object. So in order to motivate this object where switching one and two is going to give us a symmetry of that object, we're actually just gonna take a step back and look at what that shuffling is mathematically. So if we go ahead and recall what that shuffling map was, uh, we'll call it pi here. One went to two, two went to one, three went to itself, and four did as well. Pi is what is called a permutation. And so in an intuitive sense, and in this case specifically, it's shuffling the numbers one, two, three, and four in a explicitly defined way. Back with the square, when we labeled the vertices with one, two, three, and four, we were actually just talking about the vertices. The numbers themselves didn't have a meaning. They were just a way of indexing the object of the vertices. So instead of writing one, two, three, and four here, we're just gonna go ahead and write V1, V2, V3, and V4. So now that we have this graph labeled with V1, V2, V3, V4, let's go ahead and assume that for some reason the square graph is of an interest. So in, in graph theory, sometimes it's useful to go ahead and assign weights to vertices or edges, depending on what you're doing with your graph or how you're applying that graph to a particular problem or to a real world situation that might happen. Um, but when you go ahead and assign weights to the vertices, you can then define a function called the total weight function of the graph, which is a function on the vertices of the graph, so f of v1, v2, v3, and v4, and that function is equal to the sum of all of the vertices. So the function here is actually quite accessible because 
We're not doing much. We're taking these vertices and the numbers that we've assigned to these vertices and we're adding them together. And so it makes sense that the total vertex weight of the graph would just be the sum of the vertex weights. And you might notice that the vertex weight sum doesn't actually depend on any configuration of edges or how the edges land on the piece of paper where we're expressing the graph. And so let's go ahead and take a look at what pi would do to this function when pi is shuffling the vertices as it did before. So instead of shuffling vertex labels, now our pi is shuffling the actual variables of our function. And so pi of f of v1, v2, v3, v4 is equal to pi of v1 plus v2 plus v3 plus v4, which is equal to v2 plus v1 plus v3 plus v4. And then we can use some commutativity of addition to get back to v1 plus v2 plus v3 plus v4, which was our original function. And so we can say that pi is a symmetry of this function. And in fact, if we chose any pi, that shuffles the numbers one to four in a predefined way, we would be able to get a symmetry of this function. And so mathematically, it's actually kind of interesting to think about properties that are invariant under certain transformations. So in this case, the function itself is invariant under all of these different permutations. But that sort of begs the question of what are the other things that are invariant under these shufflings of our variables. So functions, and more specifically, what we're gonna care about are polynomials that have this property where all of the shufflings of the variables will result in an invariant transformation of that function to itself are called symmetric polynomials. So a polynomial of n variables, p of big X sub n, where the big X sub n just represents x1 all the way through xn being placed in there as variables is a symmetric polynomial if for every pi that is just some shuffling of those n variables we have that pi composed with the polynomial is just equal to the original polynomial that we started with and again this is where pi either operates on the variables themselves or the indices of the variables which will effectively be working on the variables as we'll see here in a second some examples of symmetric polynomials actually come out of the woodwork pretty quickly. And before I get into those easier cases, I'm going to go to the ones that are more so like sort of vacuous and you might not think of initially. So the first one of those examples that might elude you just because you're focused on the number of variables in play is actually the zero function. So I'll just write it as zero of big X sub n. And that's going to equal zero for any input. Next we have another constant function, which I'll just call fancy one of x sub n, that is equal to one for whatever you input. And in fact, any constant function is a symmetric polynomial because no matter what you do with the variables, you're always going to get that constant, even if you're just shuffling the variables around before you apply the function. The two that are a little bit more straightforward that come with n variables in tow are the product in some functions. So we can say that g of big X sub n, which is equal to g of x sub 1, x sub 2, all the way up to x sub n, is equal to the product, which can be written as big pi uh, from i equals 1 to n of x sub i, which is just equal to x sub 1 times x sub 2 times x sub 3 dot 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 all the way up to times x sub n. Or we could have h of x sub n be the sum function, which is equal to big sigma from i equals 1 to n of x sub i, which is just equal to x sub 1 plus x sub 2 plus x sub 3 plus dot 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 plus x sub n. Now, the cool thing and the really bonkers thing about symmetric polynomials, which will get us to the vector space, is that you can add them together and get a symmetric polynomial, which is just uh, it's not something that I initially thought about, and I think it's really cool. So if you take G and H and you add them together, you can get a symmetric polynomial G plus H of big X sub N, which is just equal to the product of all of the variables plus each of the variables individually. When you shuffle any of the variables, that product will still contain all N 
variables and that sum will always contain all n variables, but it'll just be in a different order in each case. And you can use commutativity of each operation to get things back in line. So I just claimed that all of these symmetric polynomials make up a vector space. I should probably prove it, right? So we're gonna go ahead and write big lambda sub n is equal to the set of f in big F square bracket big X sub n. So that big F is not a function itself. It is a field. You could take the rationals, you could take the real numbers, you could take the finite field of two elements. Any field will work here. And then that square brackets big X sub n just denotes the polynomial ring, which is a certain algebraic object. Um, it's going to contain all of our polynomials that have coefficients over that field. And so if we have an F in this polynomial ring, for every permutation pi in S sub n, which is just the set of all possible shufflings of the variables, if we have pi composed with F is equal to the original F, then we'll say that F is a symmetric polynomial in this space. And so that big lambda of n is the set of all symmetric polynomials. And the claim is, is that the set of all symmetric polynomials is a vector space. And so in order to prove that big lambda sub n is a vector space over any given field f, we're gonna have to prove two things. One, that there is closure under addition, and two, there is closure under scalar multiplication. So we're not gonna worry about the nitty gritty of the specific properties each operation has to have because they're the run of the mill addition and multiplication that we're used to working with. And so they should have all the same properties. If you don't believe me, you should go prove it. But it seems a little bit distracting at this point because I just wanna talk about the cool thing. So in order to prove closure under addition, we take two vectors v and w in big lambda sub n. Since v and w are in lambda sub n, they are invariant under any shuffling of their variables. So pi composed with v is equal to v and pi composed with w is equal to w. That means when we go ahead and add these polynomials or add these vectors, if you will, together, we can actually do it in parts because of the structure here. When we go ahead and shuffle the variables, we're gonna be shuffling the variables in each term of the polynomials individually, which is the same thing as shuffling each of the individual polynomials or vectors individually. So we can say that pi composed with the sum of v and w is equal to pi composed with v plus pi composed with w, but since v and w are vectors in lambda sub n, we have that this thing equals v plus w, and so v plus w is in lambda sub n. Next, for closure under scalar multiplication, this follows from the fact that the permutations don't operate on the scalars themselves. The only thing that they manipulate is the coefficients of the terms in our polynomial. So by applying pi to a constant times our polynomial, we can just bypass the constant and pull it out. So pi composed with c times f is equal to c times pi composed with f. And since pi composed with f is equal to f, as f is in our space, then c times f is in our space, big lambda sub n. And thus, we have a vector space built out of symmetry, which is crazy. So again, the thing that makes this really cool is that it kind of comes out of left field. Uh, the proof here is pretty straightforward. Um, we didn't do a lot of crazy stuff. We just used the defining property of what a symmetric polynomial was in order to prove these things. But there's another cool property of this space that makes it a little bit weird. Uh, in comparison to other vector spaces. So regular multiplication as a device to create new vectors isn't always something that works. And so the weird property that makes this vector space sort of interesting, at least to me, is that it's a vector space made out of functions where multiplication works as a method for producing new vectors. So what do I mean by that? In the L2 space over a certain interval, there is a notion of being able to pick specific uh, 
vectors and being able to multiply those specific vectors together to get another vector in the L2 space, but it doesn't work for all pairs of vectors. With symmetric polynomials, on the other hand, any pick of vectors will give you a product of functions that is also symmetric. And since I'm claiming it, I should probably prove it, right? So in order to show that any two symmetric polynomials can be multiplied together to get a third symmetric polynomial, we're gonna go ahead and start off by letting pi be some shuffling of the variables or a permutation in S sub n be arbitrary. By definition of big lambda sub n, for any pi that we've been given by this arbitrary choice, pi of f is equal to f and pi of g is equal to g since f and g are in big lambda sub n. Now we can just consider pi of the product of those two functions. And since we can apply the shuffling to each term individually, we get pi composed with f times g is equal to pi composed with f times pi composed with g. And by f and g being in big lambda sub n, we get that is equal to f times g. Since the pi that we chose was arbitrary, this actually holds for all of the pi that we could have chose. So that implies that f times g is a vector in the vector space of symmetric polynomials. So just as you go ahead and do an example, if we go ahead and take f and g, such that f is the product function and g is the sum function, f times g is going to be this gross sum product thing that is just the sum of products of all of the n variables, where in each product, only one of the variables is squared. If we consider a permutation, say the incrementing permutation, where one goes to two, two goes to three, all the way down to n minus one goes to n, and n goes to one, then pi of f times g is equal to an ugly sum, and we can just rearrange this such that each term we move the x sub one that is at the end to the front of the product, and then we can move the last term in the sum that has the x sub one squared in it to the front of the sum to get the original f times g. And so that shows that f times g was in the space. So yeah, that is, that's basically it. Um, I think, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that is, that's basically it. That's the weird vector space that I stumbled across over the past couple of months of me learning some new math and hopefully learning a little bit of combinatorics along the way. Um, but I just think it's wild that you can build a vector space with symmetry as the basis for everything essentially in that space. Because usually, at least when you're thinking about physics-based vector spaces, there's like direction and magnitude. And magnitude is like the scalar multiplication part of it and direction is like the coordinates part of the vector and then for the frequency and amplitude version like frequency is like the function that you're working with and amplitude is how scaled up that function is um, especially when you're working with sine and cosine waves and periodic things like that um, but in the case of the symmetric polynomials the math kind of like abstracts away the importance of scalar like the scalar part of it um, because we're no longer thinking of something directly applying to the real world. Um, but there's probably applications somewhere. Um, when we were talking about the, uh, the total vertex sum thing earlier on, that sort of lends it to like a unbiased statistic on a graph because no matter how you mess with the variables or switch them around, you're never going to change the overall like ability for each variable to affect the total vertex weight. So there's probably some applications in statistics that I am currently unaware of. Um, but yeah, that's all I got for you today. I need to drink some water because my mouth is dry. Um, but yeah, so if you have any uh, thoughts or ideas that you would want me to cover in future videos, you can leave those in the comments down below. Uh, also, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more math stuff, you can give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics videos. As always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and 
I will see you at some point in the future with some like, I don't know. It's gonna be a little bit different in the next couple weeks because I wanna tell you something here in like a month and we just gotta build up to that in the right way. Um, so I gotta figure that out, it's the plan. So yeah, anyway, yep, that's it. I'm gonna hand to the freaking face of the camera now.